Hi, everyone. Welcome to the sixth episode of the Public Health Podcast. We are Oculus and Charles from the Public Health Club, and we are so happy to be joined today by Dr. Kathleen Liu. Dr. Liu is currently a professor in residence at UCSF. She has done extensive research about biomarkers in the kidneys and lungs for disease prevention, which is pertinent to many different diseases, including COVID. And in this episode, Dr. Liu discusses her work with biomarkers to identify such kidney and lung diseases and what we as high school students can do to pursue a career in such topics. The following is the discussion that she had with us. So let's just start off with uh, an introduction of like yourself, your work, and what you plan to do for the foreseeable future. So my name is Kathleen Liu. I'm a professor at UCSF. Um, uh, where I uh, have sort of a career where I get to combine all of my interests. Um, I uh, spend some of my time taking care of patients, uh, in particular in the inpatient setting. And then I spend a lot of the bulk of my time doing research, both observational research projects, looking at the association of biomarkers with acute disease states, and also doing clinical trials, um, uh, in particular in the intensive care unit. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting. So it's a variety of topics. Like I, when uh, when I first like read like your uh, your folks on biomarkers, my immediate thought was like, oh, so um, very much into bioinformatics. But uh, as I read more, and clearly you do like clinical trials, you have a lot of experience in the lab. So that's actually a really good merger of the two. Yeah. Well, maybe I should tell you a little bit about sort of how I got to be where I am because that's probably the most right kind of the most useful thing. So, I grew up in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, which is an academic town, right, a home at the University of Illinois, and I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be a science, a researcher doing some form of science. Um, you know, I worked in a lab the summer between my junior and senior years, and then the summer after my senior year, and I worked in an organic chemistry lab, where actually we, um, the person who I worked for was really interested in identifying novel organic compounds from insects, um, and the lab was sort of more broadly focused on identifying novel organic compounds from all sorts of marine, from actually marine animals, so I spent my summer actually grinding up uh, one summer, you know, tunicates, which are a uh, form of underwater sea life, and the other one, fireflies, extracting novel, novel compounds. So I went to college thinking that I wanted to do some form of research, and my um, aunt sort of advised me that I should consider an MD-PhD program if I wanted to um, do research. So I sort of embarked with that as my goal, and I did a, my PhD actually, I did my MD-PhD actually at UCSF, and my PhD is actually in basic science, right, so it's in immunology. And then what I'd say is that when I went back to medical school and then on to residency, I decided that I really wanted to do research that would translate from, you know, the basic side from the lab to the clinic. And so that's kind of how I got into really the biomarker and now the clinical trial space. I really love doing clinical trials because they're sort of the ultimate scientific experiment, right? Like you, you, you have your experimental question, you have to set up the research design and kind of set up all of your controls ahead of time, right? And then you execute the clinical trial and you kind of learn, does therapy X work more than therapy Y and so on and so forth. So I think what I'm doing now feels in some senses like a very natural evolution of where I started a long time ago. Okay, that's great. So we we're actually going to ask that next about how you got into biomedical research and biomarkers. And it's great that you kind of got into kind of this nuance between the two categories where you could conduct clinical trials and use your biomedical knowledge. So we also noticed that you have extensive research on acute kidney injury and lung failure. Uh, Akilesh has a few questions about those. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I guess you sort of talked about like how you got interested in like biomarkers as a whole, but um, definitely like these specifics like acute, acute kidney injury and like lung injuries and lung uh, damage, especially in relation to COVID-19. A lot of your recent uh, work has been in that area. So how did you get um, into that specific area? Right. So that I think is very much a natural evolution of the type of physician I am. So, so when I started, when I applied to residency, right, graduating from medical school, I got sort of this piece of advice that I should think about going into a field where there weren't that many scientists. And, you know, I actually um, 
chose nephrology kind of as my first specialty, you know, again, I think mentors are really unique people in your life, right? You have sort of a single mentor who can sort of be the person who drove you to sort of where you are, right? And so my mentor for my sort of clinical life is um, a man named Glenn Chertow, who actually is at Stanford, where he's now the vice chair of the Department of Medicine. And Glenn really inspired me as a nephrologist. I mean, one of the things I think that's really important about being a biomedical researcher is that if you, if you are a physician is that you have to love the clinical work that you do just as much as you love the research, right? So being a nephrologist, right, or a kidney doctor, right, um, I can take care of patients in the outpatient setting who are sick on dialysis. I can see patients in clinic, right? I can see the sickest inpatients as well, right? And so that really appealed to me sort of as a, re, as a clinical career, niche, so to speak. Um, and then I went on to do subspecialty training, not only in nephrology, but also critical care. So, right, acute kidney injury and acute lung injury are kind of natural extensions of, um, of kind of the clinical work that I'm most interested in. And I would say that right, my interest in, again, in the way that mentors are really important, the way that I became sort of an acute lung injury person was that as I started to move from kind of the basic science side of things to the more translational clinical side of things, um, I had the opportunity to work with Michael Mathe, who's a very senior faculty member at UCSF, who I had known since I was a medical student, in fact, and Michael's lab does clinical and translational work in the acute lung injury space. So that's sort of how I got kind of where I am, right? And then, as you know, right, COVID-19 is really a disease that affects the lungs primarily. And so again, right, in that way that, you know, you go where the science is, right, it became, it made a lot of sense for to sort of pivot some of the work that I was doing to the to the sort of COVID-19 space and to, for example, design clinical trials in that space. Can you tell us a bit about these clinical trials that you've designed in COVID-19? Yeah, so that um, so that's, I mean, again, you know, these projects are big team science, right? You have to collaborate with a lot of people. Um, and so, um, so, so, so I've been involved in kind of two groups of sort of studies that are involving COVID-19, right? So as you can imagine, before the pandemic started, the NIH had a number of clinical trials networks, right? Clinical trials networks focused on HIV, clinical trials networks focused on acute lung injury. And all of those people kind of pivoted their energies towards uh, COVID, right? And so there was a lot of work that had to happen early in the pandemic to get all of these clinical trials networks to sort of figure out how they could work together. And so actually there are a series of trials called the active trials that sort of span inpatient, outpatient, not so sick, really sick patients. Um, and that is that sort of has been sort of a big team science ex, uh, effort. On the other side of things, right, we had the opportunity at UCSF to design um, a series of, fate of clinical trials using sort of collaborators at UCSF. So again, one of my good friends and collaborators at UCSF is a woman named Carolyn Calfee, who's an expert in the field of acute lung injury and ARDS. She had done a sabbatical with one of our breast cancer surgeons, um, Laura Esterman, who has really been, revo who's really been revolutionary in designing um, uh, clinical trials in the breast cancer space to rapidly test new therapies. And so when the pandemic, and, and Carolyn had as her sabbatical thought about how to sort of move sort of that, the, the framework that Laura has developed for um, rapidly deployable clinical trials to the ARDS space. And so when COVID hit last year, it became sort of a natural partnership to develop, you know, a COVID clinical trial using the same framework. So we now have you know, this trial that we call I Spy COVID, um, which is um, uh, a, a platform clinical trial for phase two agents, right? So these are not things that are gonna go into the hospital next week. These are things where we're testing to look for big signal to identify things that could go into larger clinical trials. Um, and so we've enrolled on the order of 1,100 patients in those trials, you know, since probably the summer of last year with 650 of those patients or so receiving uh, fit novel therapies as part of the study. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think that uh, it's, at first glance, uh, you would think it'd be quite a uh, basic comparison between like COVID-19 and like uh, any lung injury. Like, I think all of us have seen like those images, but um, I think, yeah, there's definitely a bit of nuance to that. And I guess novel therapies, um, I think with your, like, definitely a quite sizable clinical trial, it, it definitely has a broad reaching impact. So I guess, we, as a global community, respect and thank you for your work on that, Yeah. Oh, 
Of course, right. And I think, right, more importantly, I think, right, there's also, right, I think the other thing, you know, that I think people at UCSF are thinking a lot about, to your point, is how do we impact our local communities and the more global community uh, as well? Right. So I guess, like, more generic and, like, say, a, take a pre-COVID world, uh, for example. Um, so take us up through a process of, like, doing one of your research projects and uh, where do you find the biomarkers um, and what techniques or technology do you use uh, regularly in the lab? And like, I guess, like, take us through a process of how you get uh, from an idea to a paper. Great. So there are lots of different types of ways to get from an idea to a paper, right? Um, and so maybe I'll describe kind of a couple of different pathways, right? The sort of most, you know, oftentimes we do what are called secondary data analyses, right? Where we have all of the data kind of in hand and we're able to do the analysis pretty quickly, right? So an example of that is that for a lot of our clinical trials, we collect biospecimens, right? And we pre-specify that we're going to measure a number of biomarkers, right? And oftentimes in the let's say in the ARDS space, we're going to measure those biomarkers and their association maybe with severity of ARDS or mortality or something else, right? You can then take that data set and turn it into a data set that you can ask a new question from, right? So for example, I've measured interleukin-6 in this population uh, with ARDS. How does interleukin-6 associate with acute kidney injury, which happens pretty commonly in that population, right? So that is a pretty straightforward project, right? You often have to write to some group of investigators, explain what your idea is, get the data set, right? And then do the analysis, you know, do the statistical analyses on your own and write them up. So that's kind of one project, right? The other type of project, right, is sort of a novel biomarker project where you want to measure a bunch of new biomarkers, right? And again, oftentimes, you know, you might do that in a small group of patients that you collect where you have samples from the hospital or, right, ideally you find a bigger data set where you can make measurements in specimens that are already collected, right? And there you often, a lot of these assays that we're using are ELISA type assays, right? So enzyme linked amino assays, so pretty straightforward technology, right? But you have to kind of demonstrate that your assay is sort of a robust ELISA assay, right? It's not the home cooked assay that I created in my garage out back, right? That it has certain sort of reliability characteristics and, you know, uh, and so you would write a proposal to sort of, in that case, right, you might write a proposal to the owner of those specimens explaining what the scientific question is, right? How you're gonna measure the biomarker, how reliable your assay is, right? And other sort of characteristics, and then you could get those samples and make those measurements and do that analysis, right? The biomarkers that I typically am measuring, I'm not doing biomarker discovery work, which is kind of a whole nother field, right? A lot of biomarker discovery is for human disease, not done in human specimens, right? Because oftentimes the human disease state is just a little bit more messy than an animal model. So ideally, right, you can create an animal model that recapitulates human disease and then uh, identify biomarkers, novel biomarkers that you can then test in human specimens from that, um, from that sort of specimen. So I'd say for biomarker research, right, there kind of is a pipeline, right? There sort of is the early discovery work, right? Then kind of the early phase human validation work, right? You have a new marker in an animal, you want to do a smaller study in humans to show that that biomarker works, right? I do less of that kind of work. I'm more in kind of the, you have a new bio, you have a bio, somebody's identified a biomarker, it seems interesting. How do you move that into a bigger population? Well, wow, that's really insightful just talking about like this general pipeline you were talking about and how we start from a smaller scale and then we gradually build it up. I think that actually makes a lot of sense where if it doesn't pass like the smaller scale test, maybe you can go back, rework it before it expands larger. Exactly. And I think one of the real challenges, right, when you think about biomarkers is biomarkers can do, a, is you really have to think about what you want your biomarker to do, right? We think, we often think that we want new biomarkers that are gonna be better than the clinical lab tests that we measure, like when you go get your blood drawn. Um, but that's actually really hard to do because um, biomarkers, a lot of the marker, the injury markers, let's say that we measure in these populations sort of overlap between people with disease and not with disease, right? Or between people who we think have disease and who we think don't have disease, because those aren't always super clear populations. And so a lot of the focus on biomarkers is also 
so right, so biomarkers can be used sort of as new lab tests, but they can also be used to sort of better understand human disease, like what are the pathways that are affected in human disease, and they can also be used to help us risk stratify a population with disease, right, and so a lot of it is thinking about what do you want your biomarker to do in your human population, and then working back to kind of the right sort of preclinical and early clinical models. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and uh, we had another question asking about if you could describe these kind of challenges that you had during COVID-19 for these clinical trials and during just general research during this COVID-19 period of time. Well, those are great questions, right? So when COVID-19 hit, right, um, we, you know, appropriately shut down all of our research activities at UCSF that were not directly COVID-19 related. Um, and so, for example, outside of the ICU, I have a clinical trial focused on strategies for liberating patients from dialysis, right? So patients with the most severe forms of acute kidney injury wind up needing dialysis support. And what we don't know is how do, how do we get, how do we find, figure out who can come off dialysis and when they can come off dialysis, right? So that's a, that's a study of hospitalized patients, right? Um, you know, in February of last year, I was sending emails saying, I think we should probably start to think about shutting down this clinical trial because we're going to go through a phase where the hospital is going to shut down. And so we stopped that clinical trial. Uh, we stopped enrolling new subjects in March, and it took us until the summer to sort of be able to restart the kind of clinical trials mechanism, right? And even so early on, right, you know, we have study coordinators who are, you know, oftentimes our study coordinators are young folks who've graduated from college and are thinking about, you know, the next steps in their career and they want to take a gap year or two to explore medical research, right? And so obviously we had young coordinators who we needed to think about how we could safely, where we could safely have them come back to the hospital, right? And what work we needed to do because we understood all of the, you know, the donning and the doffing of PPE and all of those things. So, um, so, so, this, so for some of our clinical work, we were able to kind of get those trials kind of back up and running. And those are, hot, those are trials in hospitalized patients, right? Outpatient studies, you know, continue to still be very, you know, continued kind of until very recently to still be really affected, right? Patients obviously don't want to come to the hospital or to a medical campus if they can avoid it, right? And so some outpatient studies have really had to think about what can you do sort of via televisits or, you know, in, in sort of the home setting. Um, and then our research labs are still not back at full capacity, right? Just like you probably have at Harker, right? Like you're only allowed to have a certain number of people on campus at any given time. And so, um, so all of research has been really affected. I mean, I would say all of research is, was really affected and kind of outside of the COVID-19 research, everything really slowed down. And then for the COVID-19 projects, right? We had to kind of get those projects up and running, you know, sort of ASAP. Um, and so there was kind of this big push to get all of that work moving forward at the same time. Definitely really interesting how, um, I guess like you were uh, shutting down some projects. You had a bit of like insight, I guess, in February and March, which was pretty good. And you had the, I guess, uh, correct mindset to like have a turnaround of like uh, focus and priorities to get your COVID-19 projects up and running by the summer. So that was definitely um, really cool. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you worked with these uh, these students, young younger coordinators who um, were out of college in one or two years of gap year exploring medical research. Um, so when you work with people like them or you work with residents or uh, even graduate students at UCSF, like um, how does that like experience compare with uh, like your normal everyday lab uh, research? And also a, sort of a sub question to that is how does it compare to your experience as a resident um, when you graduated? Well, I think the best thing about working at an academic medical center, right, is the opportunity to work with young people, right? You keep us all, right? They, you know, you know, they keep it, young people keep us young, right? And keep us sort of in the sort of spirit of inquiry, right? So I think, um, so I think, so, so for me, working and teaching residents is always fun, right? And our young court, right? So research coordinators kind of come from a variety of backgrounds, right? And you need kind of a mix of both, right? Like in our research group, we have a coordinator who is a lifer, so to speak, right? Um, he's really interested in being a long-term research coordinator. Um, 
uh, has like a family member who's a research coordinator and has had great joy in that career. And right, that you need somebody like that on your team, right? Because that person over time has the experience to understand all of the intricacies of like working with human subjects protections and can help train younger people, right? You know, having young coordinators is also really fun, right? Because um, they're really engaged. They want to learn as much as they can, right? They're really interested in sort of what a career in medical research looks like. You know, they get love to work with patients um, and have that experience as part of their job. So um, I think a lot of that, a lot of that is really, you know, is really sort of fun and stimulating, right? You also, right, one of the challenges, right, of working in academia is you're always teaching new people, right? There's always somebody who you're teaching. There's, there's not never kind of a set group of people who kind of know exactly kind of how things work. Um, but that's okay, right? And that's, um, and, you know, I think that the, all the sort of benefits of having the teaching system outweigh kind of the small inconveniences potentially. Yeah, and then the second part of the question, like, how does it compare to like your experience as a resident? And like, I guess, how does your experience as a resident, like shape how you work with residents today? Yeah, that's a great, I mean, I think that's a great question. It's hard to, it's hard to remember all those sleep de deprived years ago. Um, I mean, again, I think, um, uh, again, I think, you know, I feel like my graduate school experience was really shaped and, and residency experience was really shaped by, you know, good colleagues um, and friends, right? And so, right, that's the same atmosphere that I try to have in the lab, right? That people who work, people work together most effectively when they like each other, when they think they're all working towards the same common goals, um, right? When you're, when you feel that way, right, you're willing to work 120 hours a week and you're willing to, you know, stay up until three in the morning, right? If you don't feel engaged or appreciated in your work, you don't, you don't have that feeling, right? And again, maybe growing up in an academic family, right? Both of my parents were computer scientists, right? At the University of Illinois, just the importance of taking care of the people around you, I think is really important to me. You know, I had this, you know, kind of in a funny vein, I had this experience, I had the joy, I was on service a couple of weeks ago in the ICU. And one of the really nice things about that as a teaching experience is that I get to work with the same residents over time, right? So I get to work with you one year, and then I get to work with you a year later, right? And so I had the joy of working with a young resident um, in April who I'd taken, who I'd worked with in March, right as COVID was shutting down, right? And it was really, one, it was really a joy to see how much she had grown in that last year. But one of the things she said to me was, she said, you know, I remember when you were our attending, right? And the world was about to shut down that you sort of stopped one day and you said, now, does everybody have food at home? Like who needs to go run errands, right? Because it's not like being home with your parents where there's somebody to like make sure that all those things are taken care of when you're a resident, right? You're living by yourself, right? You probably have a pretty empty cupboard because you're only shopping on days that you have off. And so those are, I mean, I think again, you know, coming from that academic background, like those are all things that I think are, those are things that I feel like my parents taught me were really important, right? When you're the supervisor, right? Your trainees are like your kids and you've got to make sure that they're not, they're not just taken care of at work, but they're also taken care of outside of work. Yeah, that certainly makes a lot of sense, kind of taking care of the people under you. Also, I really liked your point about like feeding off the energy of other people. I think one time when I was volunteering, I was teaching uh, some younger students and it was like really fun to see like them get excited over the smallest things. So I think I can kind of relate to what you're talking about there. Ab and right. then Absolutely, right? Teaching, teaching people and just having them see something for the first time and have that aha moment is really gratifying. Yeah. And now for one of the last questions, we're gonna wrap up soon. Uh, what future progress kind of excites you about the future of biomedical research? And how do you recommend students like us prepare and ready themselves to be part of such a future? Gosh, I think the future, I mean, I think the future is really exciting, right? Like if you look at the world of cancer chemotherapeutics and you look at where things have come in the last 20 years, right? The pace of science is just unbelievable right now, right? I studied a pathway in graduate school, right? Not, I'd like to think not so long ago, right? 1996, 1997, right? Um, before you were all born, but not, you know, outside, not so far outside the realm of sort of 
recent history, right? And I studied a pathway called the JAK-STAT pathway that at the time was brand, brand new, right? And now we have chemotherapeutic agents that are directed against molecules in that pathway, right? That's a remarkable sort of pace to go from identifying something, understanding where it fits into human disease and developing therapies that are targeted against that. I think we all hope that we're gonna see that same kind of accelerated progress kind of across all of bi the biomedical fields. I mean, I think, I think what I would say, right, is that uh, careers are, um, you have to be somewhat flexible in sort of what you think your career is going to be like, right? Um, the world is going to change very, very quickly in your lifetimes, right? And so being wed to wanting to do a specific thing, right, is going to be really hard, but sort of being open to learning new things and new processes and thinking about the world in new ways, I think is gonna be really instrumental to, um, to your success. And I think finding something you know, what I'd also say, I think, is that the research pathway is really hard. So um, one of the things that I'm reminded of is, uh, you know, my wise division chief, who's like the smartest, one of the very smartest researchers I know, you know, always reminds me of how important it is to also love all of the other aspects of your work, the clinical work, as much as the research work, right? That way you find fulfillment, like even when you have a bad research day, right? There's fulfillment and joy in kind of the overall day. And I think that that is really sustaining for me. Yeah, I guess one sort of sub question on that, um, like when you're talking about the clinical and research experience, as we move forward, there's uh, a lot of, um, th 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 there's a lot of new research, new techniques out there, which are much more invasive, much more, um, I guess they have a lot more potential than previous techniques. And that also comes with a lot more like ethical qualms or ethical um, observations. So where do you see that sort of conversation um, heading moving forward? And um, how do you think uh, the development of new technologies will like navigate uh, surrounding that context? Yeah. That's a great, that's a great question. I think a really hard one to answer. Um, you know, I think we're going to have, I think that as we think about more invasive techniques, we really have to think about how we have conversations with patients and families about understanding what those, what the pros and cons of those techniques and approaches are, right? Um, and so I think it, it really requires kind of ongoing dialogue. Um, I think, right, one of the real challenges for the work that we do, you know, I think one of the real, one of the things that COVID-19 has really magnified, I think for me personally, is the disparities that we see in care um, potentially across different populations with different socioeconomic status and other things. And so I think, you know, it's my hope that I, you know, that we will, one of the lessons that we will learn as we kind of emerge from this COVID-19 pandemic is how we involve affected communities in those dialogues about, you know, the research that's being done, what the implications are, um, what the meaning of that research is. And those are really complicated questions, right? Because, um, you know, I'll give an example is, um, you know, I have a colleague who works, um, you know, with the Black community and, you know, people are doing these COVID-19 questionnaires and, you know, we always say, oh, great, we can aggregate all this data from these questionnaires and then, you know, so-and-so can do a secondary analysis. And she was like, wait, wait, these people are willing to, you know, answer these questionnaires to answer a specific set of questions, right? They might not feel so comfortable with their information going into an anonymous data set where everybody can, you know, look at that information, right? So talking and having community involvement as you design studies and as you are thinking about these things, I think is gonna become even more important, right? Especially as we get to this idea that you can, you know, maybe, you know, in your lifetime, there'll probably be some DNA tests that we can do that will tell you about your predisposition to a bunch of different conditions, right? And that, that information could be scientifically very useful to you, but how we protect you from, you know, insurance liability, right, from your employer getting that information, those are going to be areas where we really have to think and be careful and thoughtful. And it'll be yeah. important to have patients involved in those discussions. It's already become very common in, in it's becoming much and more, more common in human studies now to have patient, ad, patient advocates involved in studies, right? So an example of that is the NIH has a large uh, project um, called the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, which is uh, focused on doing kidney biopsies in patients with acute and chronic kidney disease. Um, I'm not actually involved. Uh, I was on the external advisory panel for that project for a year, but I'm not actually involved in it, right? But that project has had patient advocates sort of 
as part of this, the design, right? So the consent forms about doing a kidney biopsy, right, which may or may not give that patient information that's important to them, but will give us important scientific knowledge, right? That consent form was vetted by, you know, a number of patients who had had kidney biopsies or could understand what a kidney biopsy was and who were at the table when the researchers were talking about the risks to really make sure that the consent form would be something that patients could understand. Yeah, definitely. I think that uh, this new age of like having uh, proper consent and even your discussion of socioeconomic disparities actually reminded me of uh, my biology teacher this year uh, gave us an article to read about the uh, Henrietta Lacks cell line, yeah. um, the immortal cell line. Uh, and it, it def there's a lot of parallels um, when you're talking about like, I guess, mistrust and in putting your information in anonymous data sources. Yeah. And uh, I guess this new adaptation, which um, I guess the NIH and I guess the whole scientific community is doing is definitely uh, very good for progress in uh, patient uh, doctor, I guess, relations. Yeah, though I think we have to, right, though I would say, I think a couple of things, I think we have to, right, we have to own the fact that we have, unfortunately, you know, an over 100 year history of, you know, mistrust because of things that the scientific community has done, right? And so we will have to continue to work very hard to work, uh, to work with individuals from communities that have been mistreated in the past to continue to, uh, to, to continue to sort of gain that trust, right? And I, and I think one of the challenges, right, is ensuring that you have the right representation. Like, it, you know, when you have a, when you have a, you know, when you have a panel of patients, right, making sure that you've got representation from all of the affected communities um, is really critical and can be really challenging. So hopefully this day and age where everybody is used to the, you know, the, the, the Zoom and the teleconference sort of helps with some of those things, um, but it's obvious, it, I think it will continue to, it's a challenge that we have to really think about. Yeah, definitely. Just having more transparency and having more communication between all the communities. Yeah. So, excellent. Well, Dr. Liu, we really appreciate you coming today, and it was great to have you speak to us. I learned a lot from your talk, and I'm sure Akhlesh did as well. Uh, your yeah. amazing perspective as a nephrologist and an acute lung injury researcher has been really instrumental to us. And this, thank you, Dr. Liu, for stopping by and talking to us. Of course. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm impressed that you were able to find me sort of online. I'll, I'll share that. Um, I'll share that. You know, our iSpy trials are run by a group called Quantum. Uh, Leap Health Collaborative, which is a nonprofit organization. Actually, the CEO of Quantum's kids are coming to Harker next year. Um, and so I think like maybe as a, both in middle school, I think. Um, and so I was joking because your invitation came like right around the time that his kids got into Harker and that he decided, that they, <laughs> and they decided to go to Harker. And I was like, James, I was like, James, do you know these kids? And he was like, no, I don't. But <laughs> seemed like a good coincidence. It seemed like a nice coincidence. And uh, I wish you all the best of luck with your sort of future endeavors. And it's great that you're thinking about all of these things, right? I certainly don't think that when I was in high school, I was asking other people kind of sort of what my career could be like. So best of luck to you. Of Thank course, you so it's much. our pleasure. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Have a good day, guys. <laughs>